I uh, <clears throat> was thinking about the basic three-part structure of this scene from Return of the P Pink Panther and the three-part structure of a typical joke. So I found a sufficiently corny one on the right-hand side, the setup line and then the straight line and then the punch line. And in the same connection, looking at the Wellerisms, I think I've found the form of the Wellerism, which is basically a, a modification of the three-part joke form. The, the Wellerism combines the setup with the punchline, if that makes sense. And so I provided a few examples of Wellerisms on this page. It's interesting that the second one that I cite here is not from Sam Weller. Does anyone know who else delivers Wellerisms in the Pickwick Papers? His father. Uh, yeah. Yes. Yeah, Tony. I want to talk more about Tony a little bit later because he was very popular, nearly as popular as Sam among early readers. But what I'd like to do is to look at how Dickens uses the sequence of three parts in a scene in, from chapter 38, the last chapter in our section of the novel. This is the uh, Dark Lantern chapter. It's four pages from the end of chapter 38. Oh, well, Three, page, three pages and a little bit more. Yeah, you know, four pages is right. Does anyone remember the scene where Pickwick has decided to chaperone Mr. Winkle in his efforts to court Arabella Allen? Mm -hmm. right. And uh, there, there's a problem with the dark lantern that uh, Mr. Pickwick has decided to bring with him on this, this errand. So I'm on page uh, 528 in the Penguin edition. When Pickwick has started to use his dark lantern, they haven't yet uh, accosted Arabella. I'm thinking here also about uh, Henri Bergson's comment that comedy is the victory of the mechanical over the human. And uh, secondly, of course, I think the Freudian notion that all comedy is just a little bit sadistic. So I think the, those qualities are combined in these scenes. This is Sam speaking. That our blessed lantern will be the death of us all, exclaimed Sam peevishly. Take care what you're doing on, sir. You're sending a blaze of light right into the back parlor window. Is everybody able to find this, something close to it? Could it be that it's actually chapter 20, 39, not 38? No, it is chapter 38. Oh, it depends on how they numbered. Oh. It depends on how they number chap the, uh, the Christmas chapters. So it could be third 39 in your book. 
The in thing the is, we were at the top of page uh, 528, the Correct. very top of the page, about four lines down. Yeah, and the Penguin edition, it's, it's 528. Yeah, there were two chapter 20s in the original edition. Dear me, said Mr. Pickwick, turning hastily aside, I didn't mean to do that. Now it's in the next house, sir, remonstrated Sam. Bless my heart, exclaimed Mr. Pickwick, turning around again. Now it's in the stable, and they'll think the place is afire, said Sam. Shut it up, sir, can't you? It's the most extraordinary lantern I ever met with in all my life, exclaimed Mr. Pickwick, greatly bewildered by the effects he had so unintentionally produced. I never saw such a powerful reflector. It'd be one too powerful for us if you keep blazing away in that manner, sir, replied Sam, as Mr. Pickwick, after various unsuccessful efforts, managed to close the slide. Now, the second part of this sequence involves Pickwick climbing on Sam's back to peep over the garden wall and uh, accost or greet Arabella and tell her that Mr. Winkle wishes to speak with her. Naturally, Pickwick makes a misstep and falls down, but he is able with Sam to escape into what looks like an alley. And Mr. Winkle then is able to speak briefly with Arabella. Then we move to a third sequence here, which involves an elderly gentleman. So I'm skipping down about a page. While these things were going on in the open air, an elderly gentleman of scientific attainments was seated in his library, two or three houses off, writing a philosophical treatise and ever and anon moistening his clay and his labors with a glass of claret from a venerable looking bottle which stood by his side. In the agonies of composition, the elderly gentleman looked sometimes at the carpet, sometimes at the ceiling and sometimes at the wall. And when neither carpet ceiling nor wall afforded the requisite degree of inspiration, he looked out of the window. In one of these pauses of invention, the scientific gentleman was gazing abstractedly at the thick darkness outside when he was very much surprised by observing a most brilliant light glide through the air a short distance above the ground and almost instantaneously vanish. After a short time, the phenomenon was repeated, not once or twice, but several times. At last, the scientific gentleman laying down his pen began to consider to what natural causes these appearances were to be assigned. I won't go ahead and read the rest of the chapter, but the scientific gentleman decides that he will write a treatise on this uh, very strange phenomenon that he's observed. And he calls in his manservant, Pruffel. Pruffel tells him that it's probably just robbers, but the scientific gentleman will have none other. So I, I was curious about a number of things here, the three-part form, and I guess whether or not it works, the, the way the sequence builds up to the scientific gentleman and his servant. So I guess that's my, my question here is that, <laughs> Does the, the three-part sequence uh, manage to culminate and uh, create a, an effect that one couldn't have otherwise? Well, I, I have uh, one observation about that. Um, th this joke, is, it, I think it works, and it actually worked earlier in the book. Mm -hmm. uh, Pickwick discovered the little ancient ar archaeological artifact, and what did he do? He wrote a treatise on it, or and and uh, and there was great debate about it. So this is actually a, 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 the second time around with with slight t tweaks uh, of that particular joke. You know, some sort of great ob uh, observation. Um, also falling falling uh, off, uh, you know, Sam uh, tumbling uh, Pickwick to the ground accidentally during some sort of covert action at night it happened earlier as well when uh, Sam launched Pickwick over a wall. Uh, so, th so there's a farcical element re re repeating the same. Yes, that's uh, an interesting point because 
uh, by the by this scene, we can almost see it happening. We're not sure it's how it's going to happen, but it will happen. I I think we could go ahead to the next slide unless we have any other comments. Wayne, I would like to say in this uh, this particular episode with the scientific gentleman, as with Bill Marks, his Bill Styles, his mark, it's like having been an academic, I love that. I mean, it's like mm. Dickens is making fun of some of the preposterous elements of academia before academia was anything like as well established as it is now. And if, you know, when I reread Hard Times recently, I thought he never met Betsy DeVos and Dickens <laughs> did a faculty meeting, you know, but it's just, it's just such a, indication of his um, incredible imagination that uh, he comes up with these things that in some ways I think ring truer now even than when he originally wrote them. It's interesting. What, what do you think is the effect of juxtaposing the scientific gentleman with Pickwick himself? What, what, what changes our view of Picnic? Pickwick, I guess. <laughs> You mean that he's sort of inept and clumsy and all that? Well, he's, uh, in the case of the magic lantern, I guess you could say he's inept, yes. Yes, falls off clumsy. Sam's back, so yeah, clumsy. Yeah, <laughs> he's generally, he, he's generally a, a person, if you knew him, you might, if you didn't love him to death, you'd deride him, you know. Yes, yeah, you might kind of watch out to see if he's, if he was going to break something. <laughs> <laughs> this is why he has Sam Weller, you know. Yeah. <laughs> he needs his own Sam Weller. Yeah, he needs mm -hmm. Sam Weller. And, um, I read something that he's, he's his Sancho Paza, you know. Yes, uh, but, some, some critics have said that Sam Weller really is, the roles are reversed to a certain extent. Yeah. He is parental towards Pickwick at times. Yeah, but Paza looked after a Don Quixote. Yes, yes. And as Mr. Goodman pointed out, when you think of the other occasion when uh, Pickwick t behaved very similarly towards the artifact he found on the ground in the village, uh, there is a parallel with the scientific gentleman here. They're both people so sure of their, their uh, academic <laughs> abilities that they can be easily blinded to reality. Yes. <laughs> yes, that's very, that's very, very good. But they're well-meaning, certainly. The they scientific have a sense of awe and a sense of uh, wonder about things like a scientific yes. person would or like a, like uh, a certain Dr. academic Atlas. would. <laughs> um, I think they are similar in that way because they, uh, they look at things and they don't just say, oh, that happened. They, they say, oh, wow, this is the most amazing lantern I ever saw or this is the most scientific, <laughs> you know, so they go think about exploring it, maybe all screwed up in doing it, but they, um, they're they wondering about it. And people like, I think, if I'm not mistaken, Darwin was an independent person. He was not an academic, a right. strict academic. He was a scientific gentleman. <laughs> I'm correct there. Yep. I think one of the things that Dickens is after here is people's quest to become famous and their, their, their willingness therefore to seize on something as their discovery uh, without investigating whether there's anything to it. Ah. At the very end of the chapter, as a matter of fact, the scientific gentleman ends the chapter. As to the scientific gentleman, he demonstrated in a masterly treatise that these wonderful lights were the effect of electricity and clearly proved the same by detailing how a flash of fire danced before his eyes when he put his head out of the gate. Actually, that's when Sam Weller uh, knocks him uh, in order to escape, knocks him down. And how he received a shock which stunned him for a full quarter of an hour afterwards, which demonstrates delighted to all 
scientific associations beyond measure and caused him to be considered a light of science ever afterwards. <laughs> Well, in this slide, I wanted to point out what distinguishes this middle third of the novel. And that is the development of the legal case against Pickwick. The, our first chapter 20, it so happens, is Pickwick's visit to Mrs. Bartle's attorneys. And that prepares for the sequence that culminate in chapter 33, the long chapter covering Pickwick's trial, which by the way, Dickens manages to make funny. And then the chapter 33 ends when Pickwick refuses to pay the 750 pounds assessed damages. And that then of course, that refusal sets up the much of the last third of the novel, which as you know, involves Pickwick's imprisonment for debt and final release. Uh, I was curious, first of all, if anyone wondered why the judge at Pickwick's trial, Bartle versus Pickwick, cuts the damages in half. Mrs. Bar Bartle asked for 1,500 pounds. I, I, was that I don't was that a mistake on Dickens' part, or is there some reason the judge would do that? That's after Sam speaks, and it's Sam's evidence that makes it very obvious what the the attorneys mm -hmm. are up to, and may make the judge think twice about the case. And and I don't think that's that unusual for a plaintiff to come in asking for a sum and actually get an award of something less than what they ask for. They sort of set, set out that higher number hoping that they'll get something close to that, you know? So I don't think it's that unusual. It, it, yeah. it looks to me like something Dickens had actually observed or knew yeah. about. As I said, I, I don't know about English courts, but American courts that would not be unusual for you to award um, an amount that was less than what was originally requested. So it gives a, a touch of reality to the trial. Mm -hmm. Dickens had just recently covered the trial of Mrs. Norton, which, and he uses some of the details of that in this trial. Yes. That's the attorney's effort to turn uh, housekeeping notes into coded mm -hmm. uh, sexual messages. messages chops and tomatoes. Yes. <laughs> Anyone uh, else very possibly notice how chapter 33 weaves in events from the Ipswich episode? That's in chapter 22 through 25. When Pickwick gets into trouble for or is accused of in planning to, to, uh, to duel. <clears throat> Hi, Phil. Oh, fine, thanks. I gather that you were. Are we talking about the second duel that didn't happen? Yes. And, uh, well, yes, the second one that didn't happen. That's correct. The one in Ipswich, it comes up in Mr. Winkle's testimony in chapter 33. Ah, yeah, that's, I forgot. Yeah. And, and um, Dower is afraid that there's going to, you know, that he's going to be challenged, is he not? But yes. But, but in the courtroom, it, it's used to sort of undercut Winkle's standing as a character witness because he starts to, he tells what, a, what it starts telling the court what a wonderful man Pickwick is. And then he suddenly goes off and 
reveals this particular incident is sort of uncut, undercutting that testimony, so. Yes. I'm just thinking about the character of Mr. Winkle because <clears throat> just over and over again in a novel that makes fun of a lot of characters, Mr. Winkle is always, it seems, the butt of, mm -hmm. um, he, he just can't do anything right. I mean, he can't shoot straight. He can't, uh, you know, he can't uh, ice skate. He can't. And he, with all the good intentions in the world, he's, he gives devastating testimony on behalf of his dear friend. Yeah, you yes. wouldn't want him on the witness stand. <laughs> he, he just should not be on the witness stand. <laughs> <laughs> Is it a coincidence that he's the youngest Pink Pickwickian? Now that's a good question. Huh. Well, it's not a coincidence for Dickens. Dickens made him that on purpose. I mean, clearly. he does. I mean, part of it, he gets in trouble a lot because of his love life. And maybe being the youngest member of the group, he has more of a love life than others <laughs> do. <laughs> Could be. <laughs> he at least wishes for it more. Right. Well, let's not, nobody wishes for it more than Mr. Tupman. <laughs> it's just not very plausible. <laughs> right. <laughs> it's funny that Dickens makes fun of Lotharios as he does, I think. You mean give it his history? Yeah, that <laughs> Lothario that he is. <laughs> However, he was on his honeymoon, apparently, so. <laughs> Look how that, that worked out. May have influenced it. Mm -hmm. I think we could check out the next slide. Thank you. I wanted to quote from Jonathan Grossman's book on the uh, legal system in the 19th century novels. And uh, I, th I thought he put it better, much better than I can put it. I'll just let you read that on your own if you would like. Is it up there? Okay. The trial of Bartle against yeah. Pickwick ushers in a more yeah. complicated narrative transformation. Okay. <laughs> I can go ahead and read it if you'd like me to. Yes, it would be better if you read it. And okay. we're looking at it too. The trial of Bartle against Pickwick ushers in a more complicated narrative transformation than simply the introduction of what Kinsey in his introduction to the Clarendon edition terms narrative coherence, which is only plot in its most plotting sense. As the serial becomes a novel, a tension between plot personified by the lawyers with their machinations and anecdote personified by the good-hearted Pickwick becomes a theme and problem animating the story. A Pickwickian worldview that revels in a fluid and fragmentary life, acknowledging only the temporary unit of vignettes, encounters an opposing legal novelistic ideology in which system and underlying intrigue loom ominously. And here I comment uh, Dickens may have been recalling the bland but nefarious lawyer Dowling, who aids and abets Bliffle and Tom Jones. But this passage made me think, is this really a problem? That is, it seems to me the legal plot really adds a great deal to the Pickwick papers. Oh, I think so too. You saying it does? I think so. I mean, it's something that shouldn't be funny. The fact that he can make light of it is just because mm -hmm. that's his intent in this whole book to make fun of a lot of things. But it, it's a serious matter, a legal proceeding which you could get charged yes. 1,500 to 750 pounds. Yeah. Yeah, yeah I think- And being I, in I, prison. I, I, prison. Sure. Um, I that it's an interesting point. This looming thing happening, uh, uh, kind of beyond all of these episodes. Uh, I I don't want to go too far out here, but like in Hamlet, 
they're uh, Shakespeare's Hamlet. Um, you know, there's all this uh, plotting going on, but looming behind all of this, by the way, Norway is going to invade. Uh, and at the end, you know, after all, all of the, you know, the very immediate stuff happening in Hamlet, uh, not episodic, but, you know, the more immediate stuff. Uh, by the way, there's an invading army uh, coming at us. <laughs> Uh, so I, I sort of see that like, oh, by the way, there's a lawsuit and uh, you're going to prison uh, in, in, in this novel. Uh, does everyone think that Pickwick thought he might end up in prison? Good question. Because he never seemed to be too worried about this Bartle thing. I don't think Pickwick ever looks very far ahead. No, I don't mean if he thinks what's going to happen. Yeah, yeah he, he is a lot like the, you know, uh, innocent fool, the good heart. I mean, he's a lot like Don Quixote without actually tilting at anything in particular. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, I think he probably uh, gives lip service and, and in a sense, yeah, I'm going to prison, but I think when he gets there, he finds out it's not quite what he had anticipated, uh, perhaps. Uh, I think because he lives so much in his head and really doesn't take, most people learn more from experience than Dickens, than Pickwick does. Pickwick goes through life protected from learning, you know, actions follow, consequences follow actions in some, you know, weird way. And therefore he can say, oh yeah, I, I'm going to prison. But the reality is just not part of, in any way, his mental construct. That, I don't that, think he ever thought that he was going to be found guilty. I think that he knew that he never, in, he, he hadn't proposed to Mrs. Bartle that anyone should understand that who knew him and it was just beyond his comprehension that he could be found guilty. Um, I think you're right. Yeah, I agree. That's why he wasn't worried. Right. It also might be why the judge, although I do agree with Tom, and that's the way the courts work, but it's very possible the judge, who I don't think said that much, um, just said, oh, yeah, the plaintiff should get something here. You know, uh, it's not entirely sure that he believed it. Mm -hmm. I someone may know more about monetary value in 1836 than I do. I think you could live quite comfortably on 600 pounds a year. Is that oh, right? Yes. yes. Oh, yeah. And all the novels I've read, they could. <laughs> so this this would be a, about a little more than a, a year's salary for maybe an upper middle class person. Right. In Trollope, they were living on like three hundred dollars, three hundred pounds a year, with a little with a little job, you know, like a, a curate or something. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I know this in Cranford, be... in Cranford, they talk about even a hundred pounds a year, and yeah. people somehow eke out a living. This is mm -hmm. the best of my recollection. I think that was the more of a curate's pay. Yeah, because a curate isn't that big, you know. Yeah, they hard, hardly anything. Well, we can we can uh, talk about this more at length, but this legal plot uh, brings up a question about whether a Pickwick really does change in the course of being prisoned. It's a little bit beyond our third of the novel, however, but I guess we won't be trespassing too much on the next meeting. I felt on my first reading that. Pickwick, with actually second reading of the novel, Pickwick does change. But an early critic, G.K. Chesterton, maintained that Pickwick does not change, only the mood of the novel changes when he's imprisoned. Hmm. So what are your thoughts about whether the legal plot really has an effect on Pickwick? I have a comment because I've never finished this book. I'm going to read it in thirds because oh. I'm reading too many other books simultaneously. 
Yeah. And uh, yeah, as I say that this is probably a spoiler for the I don't mind. Wonderful third section of the of the yeah. novel. Oh, I don't mind. It'll help me. But it, I'll raise the question here anyway. That uh, I think we can answer it more adequately. Uh, January twenty fourth. <laughs> absolutely yes. Yeah. But Glenna certainly has opinion because she's read it a lot. <laughs> well, <laughs> one thing I want to say before that today is over is that in this rereading, I was struck by how funny I find it. And when I was 11 or 12, when we read it out loud, and I keep talking about this because it was really um, a, just a catalytic moment in my life as a reader. I so fell in love with Dickens. I thought it was hilarious when I was a little kid. And I just think it's interesting that the same piece of literature can be strike a person as really funny as a little kid and now, as a senior citizen, to put it mildly, I still find it hilarious. That's very close to my experience of the novel, too. I read it when I was 17, I think, for the first time. And I think we read it for an English class, and I was the only one who found it funny. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, it was the was the question is it the a question of whether Pickwick has this churning in his mind the the looming court date and then maybe sentencing was that was that what was yes asked? I, Chesterton felt that Did anybody's screen the legal froze? plot darkens the mood of the novel but does not really change Pickwick and I'm not sure I can agree. It, it seems to fade into the background. I mean, it, it pops, it, the elements of it pop up from time to time, like tent posts or something. But it, it, between that, between those, it, it, it does seem to disappear. And then there will be a reminder as, as that the court, it, the court date comes. And uh, it, 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 it seems to be like Pickwick, it, it vanishes from Pickwick's mind. Uh, there's no mention of it. And then there's, there, he gets a, poked in the ribs, so to speak, uh, yes. by, the, by this. I think that's very true. I think we could try the, the next. Looking at the book from the outside, I think one of the things Dickens is trying to do with this opportunity where he's been handed the ball and he can run with it, he wants to show that he's not just a comedian. So he puts in the inset stories to add some darkness. And he's putting in a dark element with the prison. He said somewhere in a letter later on that he wanted a magazine that he was doing or a book to be like a piece of bacon, streaky. With some streaky fat bacon. Some lean. <laughs> With some fat, huh? That's good. <laughs> well, there we go. Yeah. I wanted to look at some of the books that Dickens read and that we know influenced him. Uh, he did, after all. Uh, name his first son Henry Fielding Dickens. So, <laughs> but uh, Pickwick is a, a quixotic figure, and what I did was just kind of briefly list the least major examples of uh, quixotic fiction. Everyone knows, of course, about Don Quixote. I didn't realize it was translated into English as early as. 1612. Wow. Wow. So uh, it gets it got started in England very quickly. Then, of course, Henry Fielding wrote two books that could be considered uh, quixotic, I guess. Joseph Andrews, a comic epic poem in prose, in imitation of Cervantes. And then, of course, Tom Jones. And I think it Tom Jones is an example of a book that is quixotic, but not episodic. <laughs> As I mentioned, uh, uh, 
at the bottom there, Tom Jones is elaborately plotted. Some critics have said it's over plotted. Uh, it's uh, fascinating to read, just, just to see the various ways that Dickens uh, assembles and assorts events. And then I wanted to include a woman, Charlotte Lennox, the female Quixote in 1752. And then most importantly, I think, Tobias Smollett's last novel, The Expedition of Humphrey Clinker in 1771. Smollett had also done an earlier novel, Sir Lancelot Greaves, in which yes. he was doing Don Quixote in England. Yes, perfect. Yeah, yeah that's, that's a good point. <clears throat> and I believe Smollett made his own translation of Cervantes at some point. Right. And uh, so there really is a strong uh, genealogy, I think, among these, among these writers. Uh, <clears throat> I mentioned the new term for interpolated tales. They're intradigetic, or and they're distinguished by having interdigetic narrators. And these really constitute a large portion of Don Quixote. This might be, though, a good question to ask. I personally feel that you could delete all the interpolated stories from Pickwick Papers and have a better book. <laughs> uh, anyone want to comment on someone that's already mentioned that they are intentionally very dark in contrast to the comic episodes? I'm sorry, I'm which, are the, which are the dark part? Sorry. <laughs> You find them irritating? Yeah, they, they interrupt the story. And I think, why why is this here? It doesn't, they no. don't seem to fit with what's anything that's going on. They're just in there. I don't know. Why are they in there? I don't know. Well, the little there stories, are several the that feature spouse abuse. Yeah. Yes. That's a good question. I, I don't get it either, and I don't like it either. Uh, Back when we did Pickwick Papers at the Universe, I was sitting next to a student essay prize winner. After, and when uh, we had the lecture on Dickens' Stagecoach Network, and the student said to me, do the interpolated tales fit? And I said, that's a good question. Let's ask him. So we went up to Jonathan and she asked the question and he came up with an explanation for the interpolated tales. He said that they all have something to do with transportation. Mm -hmm. I don't find that that holds water on rereading it, but that at least gives a, a common connection to some of them. But even if they had to do with travel, uh, so what? Is that because Pickens and his buddies are, I mean, Pickwick, they're always running around? So we need more, more indication of everybody runs around? Jonathan's uh, point in his lecture and then in his book on the transportation network oh. talks about the Pickwickians' travels being enabled by this fairly recently established <coughs> network of coaches, you could go to such and such an inn Tuesday morning and know that there would be a coach heading to Rochester or wherever that they were scheduled. And it strikes me that people do tell each other stories on long land journeys, if you, especially on buses, not so much on planes, but I used to ride the bus cross country in the 1970s. And uh, that's what we did. We, t we told each other, usually there were stories about our lives <laughs> or anecdotes. <laughs> yeah, I, I found them to, uh, to be distracting, but I think 
they painted a picture of how people interacted at that time. You know, just as you were saying, they told each other stories. So it it kind of it uh, made the setting maybe more realistic to his readers. Well, if you think about that high back chair that uh, that episode, it was like an acid trip. And I don't think they had LSD back then, but the whole way <clears throat> the reality was transformed and the chair was talking, a little story was so different than all the other stories. Did anyone else feel that was hallucinogenic? Yes, it makes me think of the ghost stories in this section where the, uh, the, the, the sex ghost thing. is living in the closet, for example. Certainly supernatural. <laughs> you mean ghosts are supernatural? <laughs> You don't have ghosts in your closets? Are you sure? Oh. <laughs> Are you sure? Of course. Who <laughs> can get that far into the closet to find out? <laughs> <laughs> that I think that's uh, there's another story where the young man finds the corpse in what we would call a dresser, perhaps, the corpse of the last owner. So uh, it's interesting that there are fewer interpolated tales or stories in the second half of the Pickwick Papers. Most of them are in the first half. Okay, you scholars, why is that? Good question. I tune in to hear you scholars, come on. <laughs> well, I'm not a literary scholar. I'm a historian, so I'm not speaking in any authoritative way on this subject. But first of all, I think the first time I read it, we read the interpolated stories. I have not read them since. I just mm -hmm. skipped them. Oh, there you go. <laughs> there's, there's a confession. Speaks volumes. <laughs> uh, and I, I kind of think that um, when he, I mean, he had never written a book length not, uh, narrative. And so to me, they betray a tentative writer who's kind of feeling his way to getting, I mean, this is why I think that point from Jonathan Grossman about the, you know, episodic versus the actual plot that, that we get with the legal case, I think it really is resonant because he's feeling his way to a plot. And yes. while he's not, I mean, this is how it reads to me. And conversely, I mean, for the Dickens, um, Riverside Dickens group, we read some short stories, which I had never read before, and I loved them. So it's not that I I don't like the short form, but in this particular um, reading experience, I don't want to be bothered with them. And so I don't. I'm not. Well, isn't it? I mean, I, I just, uh, I'm not a, a big fan of the, the short stories either, but my my understanding or the way I took, take it is it's a it, it's, there's a framing story and then this, in effect this is a mechanism to create a collection of short stories. I mean, in in other words, that's the reason for doing yes. that. Uh, it, whether, whether it's yes. a good idea or not, but he, he I I just figure he wanted to sh do a collection of shorts. It's an interesting within, way to look at it. This no, ep episodic novel. You mean he wants to throw in some short stories to the episodic novel? Yeah, it, 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 yeah I mean, because essentially that's what, what it ends up as. It, it, it's a collection of short stories. There, It, it isn't just a bunch add, of... Maybe it's to add to gravitas. It's like gravitas, like here, I'm a good writer or something. It is, it is interesting that the one of them sort of foreshadows Christmas Carol. I mean, this story of the sexton, really, you can look at that and go, oh, this is the beginning of the Christmas Carol. Yes, absolutely. Does, yes. does anyone know if the idea that the, the Christmas Carol story is, was that a folk tale somehow 
that a terrible person is visited by a ghost on Christmas Eve and becomes a better person after, because that's in this story in Pickwick papers, and of course in A Christmas Carol. And I wondered if that was a folk tale, but I couldn't find anything on it. Hmm. That would be really interesting to find out. Yeah. I, I, mean, I looked kind yeah. of half-heartedly. I, I need to put my whole heart into looking, I guess. I thought maybe somebody would know and I wouldn't have to do any work. <laughs> well, I can just say that um, I've been doing some research on Christmas Carol mm -hmm. and time and again, it comes up that I think most academics believe, as you say, that the Pickwick paper story was taken forward into Christmas Carol. And I've never seen anyone in my research so far saying it came from an earlier folk tale. Oh, okay. Charles Dickens did like to read a lot of newspaper and other people's works and get ideas from them. Another thing that's interesting that when he was writing Christmas Carol, he, he was in financial difficulties because his wages had been reduced by quite a bit because of this Martin Chuzzlewit wasn't doing too well. As part of his contract, his wages were reduced. So he borrowed from Thomas Mitten. Thomas Mitten was a clerk when Dickens started the legal firm of Charles Morley's office in 8 New Square in Lincoln's Inn, who later became Charles Dickens's solicitor for 20 years. So Dickens was having money trouble at the time actually writing Christmas Carol. Amanda? You mentioned earlier Sorry, about I mean, the I mean, I mean, of then and now, and one pound was worth 114 pounds these days or a hundred dollars is worth $2,798 in these days. Hmm. Thanks. Well, it, there have been several movies based on the Christmas Carol. Yes. I think the best one is Groundhog Day. <laughs> uh, can't, I think it's from about 1980. And there was one just a few years, a few uh, months ago, I, I failed to note down the title. So that basic plot is uh, very much alive and well. Mm -hmm. I guess we could go on to the next slide. Yes, thank you, Courtney. <laughs> I wanted to look at what constitutes uh, a quicksit as opposed to a picaro. Uh, Don Quixote is a member of the gentry, though he was not rich. He's not rich. He's educated, imaginative, eccentric, if not actually delusional. Her or his idealism or romantic obsession is countered by cynicism in the original sense of the term, not meaning thinking the worst of everything but rather common sense, practical, wary of illusions, frank, candid. We associate uh, Greek cynicism with the figure of Diogenes, who actually in some ways was probably an obnoxious person. Um, <laughs> the quixotic novel conducts a dialogue between contrasting worldviews, neither of which is adequate by itself. The idealist or romantic and the cynic or realist examine each other. And this is, this is basically my takeaway statement <laughs> for uh, the Pickwick Papers and other quixotic novels. The, the quixot's deficiency of self-knowledge can result in folly, but never vice. That is, he or she can't really be a bad person or an evil person. And in addition, Dickens, of course, I think derived his theory of humor from the 18th century. And writers like Dickens maintained that we, if we laugh at vice or misfortune, we are really laughing inhumanely. We can only laugh really at folly or affectation. So the quixote uh, may be affected or 
foolish, but not wicked. Uh, in contrast to Picaro, a true Picaro is a rascal or rogue who lives by her or his wits, deception, and luck. Becky Sharp and Vanity Fair is an example. And a good one. Thanks. <laughs> uh, she's fascinating, isn't she? <laughs> oh, oh. <laughs> and um, here's this, this brings up again this question about Pickwick. The Quixit, uh, the Quixit rarely changes or evolves as a character, but she or he can act exceptionally or unconventionally as Pickwick does in refusing to pay damages. And uh, finally, this question of imitation comes up. The gentleman scientist or historian is kind of a model for Pickwick. And I was interested in if you see anyone in the novel imitating Pickwick, and if so, who? Did Wayne continue speaking? I'm sorry. Uh, did you stop? I, I I didn't know if you stopped speaking or if there's been. I stopped. He's asking us. He's asking us, Cindy. Oh. Who do, who do we think could is imitating? Oh. Pickwick? If anybody. Um, aren't the members of the Pickwick Club basically all imitating him? They're all. Yes, very possibly. Very possibly. Well, in a way, Sam Weller doesn't imitate him, but he tries to live up to him. Yes, yes. I, yes. I think Sam's genius is that he very quickly, I mean, among other kinds of his genius, he very quickly takes Pickwick's true measure that this is just as disinterested a human being as you will ever encounter in your life. Yes. And he, he wants to be worthy of his employer. I, I think Pickwick's model is something of, uh, of a Renaissance man. He, he's, he's, the, the idea is, you know, satirically, he's the great rhetorician, you, you know, so he'll stand up on a chair and address the, uh, the gathered assembly at the dinner. And he's a great scientist. Uh, so, you know, doing archaeological research on little <laughs> tidbits that somebody threw away. Uh, and he's a great adventurer and writer. So he's, a, he's, he, as a quixotic character, he, if if he has to have a model, it would be some sort of Renaissance man who's great at all. But and I, I don't want to get too much into the last third of the novel, but that's where uh, really affecting things happen that I think carry off, carry forth that point that Sam does try to live up to Pickwick. Yes, indeed. Because in the first two thirds, he may be satirized as the quixotic figure, but he, he is generally uh, widely respected, is he not? I mean, these yes. all these anecdotal situations, people yes. do not deride him. They, they he, it, and I don't know, it's established that he he is someone of some financial position, if not you know extremely high. But they're not regarding him, I don't think, for that reason. He he has a reputation that is carrying him through this novel as um, someone to regard. So it seems. And then he's, he's satirized through the whole thing. Yes, he's um, he's different from Don Quixote in a way because. Don Quixote's friends think he's crazy. Yeah, that he's, he's delusional. He's always made, right, he's always derided. Right, and yeah. At the beginning, it seems to me that the narrative voice is making fun of Pickwick. 
Yes. And as Dickens goes along, it, farcical things happen to Pickwick. Yes. But he's not himself the joke. Mm -hmm. Right. It's stage comic situations. And I think a lot of this novel uh, Dickens is drawing on all the theater he'd seen. But as it goes along, you see Mr. Pickwick more and more trying to do good things, being polite at uh, Dingley Dell to the old lady and trying to help the young lovers and trying to see that Mr. Jingle can't uh, swindle others. He's quixotic, but he's, he's not ridiculous. I really like what you just said, David. And I want to say that the scene that Wayne started off with where Dickens wants to help the young lovers and he gets himself into a ridiculous position is a perfect example. I mean, he is so eager to promote the fortunes of this romance and he knows that it would be improper for Winkle and Arabella to have a rendezvous without a chaperone. And so he pops his head <laughs> above a wall somehow to say, oh, it's, you know, you're not unchaperoned. And, I mean, it's just a wonderful example of exactly what you guys were talking about. Well, he has this avuncular position that is like anybody's favorite uncle who, yeah, he's kind of a goofball, you know, but he's everybody's favorite uncle. And that's how he seems to be looked at as someone that you respect in, in spite of his farcical, you know, deals. He certainly always means well. That mean that make, means a lot. I think, well intended. Right. I guess we could go ahead, Courtney. Thanks. I wanted to look at some of the characters in these quixotic novels in light in the, this idea that there's the, the idealist and the cynic, the uh, protagonists, Joseph Andrews and Tom Jones are foundlings, neither ent entirely innocent, neither of them plays a Sancho Panza role. That is, they don't really question the quixotic figure. Uh, the quixotic figure in, uh, Joseph Adams is Parson Adams. Joseph Andrews, excuse me, is Parson Adams. And in Tom Jones, Squire Allworthy is a mild quixote, high, mild, high, a mild high character, but often too naive to judge wisely. Uh, in Joseph Andrews and Tom Jones, a cynical chorus is supplied by the commenting narrator, uh, now known as an extra diegetic narrator. <laughs> And uh, in Pickwick Papers, of course, Sam's street smarts are balanced by his wit, good nature, loyalty, and fond relationship with his father, Tony, who shares the role of cynic. So it's really a balancing act. How do you supply that practical worldly uh, contrast to the quixotic figure without making him ridiculous or uh, without intruding too much as a narrator. I wanted to take a moment here to look at the relationship between uh, Sam and Tony Weller. Tony in, in some ways shares Sam's worldly view. And this relationship is introduced in our third, in the, in the first chapter of our third of the novel. Uh, so I'd like to hear your thoughts about how that uh, father-son relationship uh, affects our reading here. It seems to me they don't really relate to each other as father-son, they relate to each other as equally adult. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. 
well, I tend clearly, to agree. Mm -hmm. I was just going to say, clearly, it's not our modern ideas of parenting that Sam has received. Um, I mean, he's been kind of turned loose into the world in a lot of ways. And mm -hmm. um, I think it's really, when you know something about Dickens' own childhood and his, you know, lifelong horror of the blacking factory and so on, the fact that he's trying to take this, well, he's taking of what was at bottom a very neglectful upbringing and turning it in, you know, giving it some tenderness. Mm -hmm. And it's a remarkable feat of imagination from one who felt underparented. So, so you would agree that there is an affection between Sam and his father. Yeah. Oh, I sure would. Yeah. I also think he gets to double down on this colloquial humor and cynicism. Yes. Um, and since I am no expert on the serialization of this, uh, how much serialization had gone on before the father came into the story? Do, do you all know? He comes in 10 chapters after Sam does. And I know the sales went up as um, uh, Christian showed at the last meeting. The sales jumped with the introduction of Sam Weller. See, I think that's why he puts him in to double down on that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it looks like a good thing. Why not expand it? That's a good salesmanship, to, to, I think, yes. marketing. Mm -hmm. And it's effective. I like it myself. So. There is also, of course, the marital unhappiness of <laughs> Tony Weller. <laughs> Which just gives a time for- um, you, mean, you mean, and they call her a mother-in-law, which we would call a step. That is, um, uh, Mrs. Weller is a variant, perhaps, of Mrs. Bartle. <laughs> I guess we could go on, Courtney. Where are the impressive women in this story? Mm -hmm. But Susan, did you have something? Yeah. Well, I was just going to comment that um, because the father had such a bad uh, relationship with his wife. Sam on numerous times, I can recall three where he said that, you know, that's right, dad, you, I believe you're, you've got experience in this matter. So he respects, <laughs> you know, so um, I think it is a loving, respectful relationship as fathers and son also. Well, I could resist uh, showing a still from the movie made of Joseph Andrews in 1977. Uh, Joseph Andrews includes, of course, an episode that replicates the biblical episode of Joseph and Potiphar's wife. You might remember that extraordinary episode. <laughs> uh, I used to teach uh, this parts of Genesis in an all boys school. And I would sometimes ask my senior class, okay guys, if you were in Joseph's position, what would you do? <laughs> and uh, they never really had a good answer and maybe there never is a good answer. But uh, in the novel, of course, Joseph is a footman and loses his place because he rejects Lady Booby's advances to him. Uh, I'm part of what Fielding was doing. He was offended by the great success of Richardson's Pamela. And so he started doing a parody of that Pamela, which is quite funny. 
And then he's still doing that in Joseph Andrews. Mm-hmm. Joseph is presented as Pamela's brother. That's correct. <laughs> and Fielding reverses the situation. Pamela is protecting her virtue from the advances of Squire B, whom Fielding spells out as Squire Booby. And so here Joseph is protecting his virtue from Lady Booby, uh, Mr. Esquire Booby's sister. <laughs> the idea was that male chastity was definitely comic. Yes, that, and of course that dates Fielding in the 18th century uh, or pre-Victorian definitely. And uh, if any of you have watched the BBC series, Victoria, Peter Firth shows up as, Firth shows up as Victoria's uncle. And uh, he has not aged well. <laughs> that was the young Victoria, right? The young Victoria? Yes. Yeah, yeah. I saw that. Uh-huh. BBC. It was good. Yes, I think, excellent. Well, you've also we got the footman. I'm sorry? You also got the footman and one of the ladies in waiting whose name I can't remember, who has a jerk for a husband. In, in Victoria. In the, in the series Victoria. In Victoria. There's the footman and, you know, they- Oh, yes, the of course. And then yes. she doesn't go because she keeps her son. Yes. And, uh, I always watch these things and I wonder how on earth do you do all that with all those clothes? <laughs> right. <laughs> well, I can't, I can't resist in interjecting then a footman, now a pool boy. <laughs> yes. yes. <laughs> if you've been following the, yeah. uh, <laughs> the yeah. modern story about the Falwell family. Yeah, yeah. exactly. <laughs> things don't really change all that much, but the pool boy. Oh my but I also want to say that I mean, some really strong affinity between Fielding and Dickens is that they want to differentiate between false uh, piety in the genuine article or false uh, good-heartedness in the genuine article. And I'm, you know, when you read about Mrs. Weller and her, uh, you know, infatuation with the red-nosed past, well, not quite pastor, and his various charities. That reminds me of Mrs. Jellybee in Bleak House, who can be good to far off uh, recipients of charity, but not her own family. So I think, you know, that's a powerful affinity between Fielding and Dickens. Yeah, I think that um, Tony Weller's revenge on the temperance pastor is a a good example of the um, kind of the role of the cynic. Uh, let's see. Yeah, that's Mr. Stiggins, the the temperance, uh, supposedly temperance pastor who Mrs. Weller uh, supports, <laughs> gets his comeuppance eventually at the hands of Tony Weller. I think we can go ahead, Courtney. I couldn't resist inserting a shot of Albert oh, yeah. Finney with uh, Diane, I guess it's Silento, in the 1963 movie of Tom Jones. Again, strictly 18th century. And uh, go ahead. Women were so inferior in the time this was written, and they had completely different morals. Um, my ex and I bought a house with a lady who was uh, called a sitting tenant, which meant we wouldn't move her out over. And her husband was a teacher, and um, he had an affair and she left him. And as long as they didn't get divorced, he wouldn't lose his job. But if she had been a teacher, she would have been instantly thrown out for having had sex 
you know, so the, there was a huge difference between, and in fact, a woman could not, I started teaching in 69, and a woman could not be married and an administrative teacher oh in my goodness. that time. My goodness. Um, and if I got a tax rebate, it went to my husband and not to me. And I paid a huge, I think I paid 65% tax and he paid 25%. And that was, Where was that, Vicky? In, was England. That in England. I mean, I started teaching as a trained and fully fledged teacher in 69. And yeah. our head teacher, the principal and vice principal, had both had to stay as single women because they were not allowed to stay as married women, even then. So when yeah. you think about when this book was written all those years prior to that, and how we'd hung on to the differentiations and how normal it was for people. Nobody questioned it. Mm -hmm. Whereas now, you know, we've got all this Me Too movement, which is whatever it is, it may not be unbiased. But in those days, women just didn't think about doing things like that. We well, women yeah. had to wear, we had to wear hose as teachers. We were not allowed to wear pants. But in yeah. those days, the mini was in. So I could stand up and reach everything and show all to the yeah. world as and long as I had <laughs> got pants on. <laughs> just, and I was 21, I didn't care. <laughs> Sorry, I shouldn't say those things. But it's I'm interesting just... that in several 18th century novels, including Tom Jones, the young heroine runs away from home in order because her father wants to force her to marry a repugnant man. Mm -hmm. And that was the only way she could uh, try to avoid a, what would be a extremely oppressive marriage would be to hope she could get shelter from family somewhere else. Okay. And uh, fortunately it works for Sophia in Tom Jones. And then we move into Dickens saving the prostitutes because- but 150 years later in the, in the, and even into the early 20th century, Edith Wharton and Henry James, I mean, they're writing about the same situation. There was no place for women to go. I mean, maybe, <laughs> as you say, Vicki, maybe tell me too, you know, two, 300 years later. I mean, when I was a little kid in school in the 50s, all, almost all those women were uh, spinsters. I mean, it, it was it was not till like my high school where there were occasional uh, married uh, teacher. And there were lesbians, but there weren't many <laughs> married women. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that you know, and it was such a oh. different time, and it was all accepted. That's why when women had to work in the First World War or the Second World War, all of a sudden, the people in those countries could see how women could work on an equal footing with men. Yes, the moment the very men dangerous. <laughs> Yes, the moment the men came back, the women were thrown out again. Back when I, America was great, right? I, I don't. <laughs> I give up. I'm, <laughs> but those historical accuracies play into Dickens and the stories. And so, because I've always been interested in history, and coming from England, I think it gives me an extra sort of boost or an understanding of relationships, which I'm happy to share. I think if we could go ahead and uh, move on, Courtney. Sorry, Courtney. This is uh, a little bit more about Smollett, maybe. Oh, my great. Just briefly. Humphrey Clinker shows up about the same time in uh, the character does as about the same point in the novel as Sancho Panza did in, in uh, yeah. Don Quixote. Uh, now S Smollett had a problem. His uh, the expectation of Humphrey Clinker is epistolary, so he had to find uh, find a way to supply the cynical or worldly chorus. Solution was the character of Matthew Bramble, who is both cynical and idealistic by turns. Uh, both Fielding and Smollett were influenced by benevolism in their conception of good character. 
uh, Pickwick is often described as benevolent. And I'd just like to go on to the next slide, Courtney. And this is a, just a quick, very short treatise on benevolism. The, uh, basically, you, I guess you would call the founder was Anthony Ashley Cooper, the third Earl of Shaftesbury. And I'd like, thought you might be interested in seeing that the 12th Earl of Shaftesbury has retained the Cooper nose. Would you agree? <laughs> yes. <laughs> that is the family nose. You're pretty handsome. But um, I brought up benevolism. I thought I'd spend just a little time on it because I think it's an often overlooked uh, aspect of. 18th century and certainly early 19th century thought and writing. To put it in a nutshell, doing good deeds makes you feel good. <laughs> uh, but I just run, ran through some. He opposed Hobbes. Uh, Cooper had been uh, tutored actually by John Locke. And you know Hobbes' point that human life is what was it? Someone can help me here. In, in the state of nature. In the state of nature. Thank you. No, uh, life is, I haven't got this quite right. Nasty, brutish, and short. Yes. <laughs> yes. Uh, Everyone for himself. Yes. That, and That's so we idea. band together in society to try to curb our natural tendencies. That's very interesting. Uh, Shaftesbury held that we naturally seek harmony and balance. We may get confused and realize that we want something else, but in fact, we want something like the qualities that we find in art, music, and architecture. And social organizations really, likewise require harmony and balance. It would be really interesting if we could get Shaftesbury's opinion on Donald Trump. Yes, it would. <laughs> <laughs> well, yes. The, it's the nasty, brutish, and short, but before that also um, solitary and poor, wasn't it? Solitary, yes. poor, nasty, brutish, short. <laughs> That's it. And I remember in an earlier uh, administration that wasn't full of um, the milk of human kindness, the New York Times columnist Maureen Dowd said that what we need in our politics is less Hobbes and more Locke. Perfect. <laughs> yeah, that's perfect. Uh, Amazing. In fact, Fielding refers to Shaftesbury at one point directly. And uh, I, I, I really believe that Pick, Pickwick as a character is his benevolence, I think, re uh, reflects this uh, this train of thought. Uh, the test of a good action is whether it's conducive to the general harmony or welfare. You can see a little bit of early utilitarian thinking in that way. I think we could go ahead, Courtney. I want to take just a moment and look at this description of Matthew Bramble in light, I think, of uh, Samuel Pickwick. So Jerry is writing a letter to his college chum back at Oxford. Mr. Bramble's character opens and improves upon me every day. His singularities afford a rich mind of entertainment. His understanding, so far as I can judge, is well cultivated. His observations on life are equally just, pertinent, and uncommon. He affects misanthropy in order to conceal a sensibility of a heart which is tender, even to a degree of weakness. This delicacy of feeling or soreness of mind makes him timorous and fearful, but then he is afraid of nothing so much as of dishonor. And although he is exceedingly cautious of giving offense, he will fire at the least he hint of insolence or ill breeding. <laughs> I'm suggesting that uh, Jerry is recognizing those uh, two traits in Bramble, which is 
uh, tenderness and good feeling, but also a strong sense of right and wrong and the willingness to get angry if need be. How different is Pickwick? I would like to know <laughs> from Ramble. He will fire at the least hint of insolence or ill breeding is Pickwick uh, in reaction to Jingle when he finds the truth. Yes. Out. Yes. So Pickwick is not entirely naive or unworldly. Don't you think it's a reflection of Pickwick's social class that he cannot be seen to not know how to act within mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. his class system? I think we could go ahead, Courtney. I wanted to spend a little time on a curious kind of humor that, of course, we find throughout uh, the Pickwick papers, especially from Sam and his father. And we don't have time, but there's that wonderful chapter where his father helps Sam write a Valentine. Maybe you remember that. See the uh, that's chapter thirty two, but it's a it's a fascinating for a number of reasons. Valentine, Valentine chapter. I think it's chapter thirty two. Yeah. What Valentine? Valentine. Sorry, yes, that's correct. <laughs> um, this kind of joke, again, I I find in feeling. In Joseph Andrews, there's a character named Slipslop who is not entirely literate and makes these, these errors that uh, can be uh, amusing. But the, this particular kind of joke is very hard to do just verbally, maybe up to a point, but it also, it really, Full, full effect requires on the printed page. So I couldn't resist giving you a little sample of Smollett's humor here, using this particular kind of visual and oral pun. This is Tabitha Bramble, Matthew Spencer's sister, writing to Mrs. Willem, housekeeper at Brambleton Hall. I desire that you'll clap a padlock on the wind cellar and let none of the men have access to the strong bear. Don't forget to have the gate shit every evening before dark. The gardener and the hind may lie below in the landry to partake the house with the blunderbuss and the great dog. And I hope you'll have a watchful eye over the maids. I know that hussy Mary Jones loves to be rumping with the men. <laughs> uh, Dickens, as I said, could not replicate all the the humor that uh, he found in Smollett. Did anyone notice that, however, the uh, significance of Tutman's name? Uh, uh, Mr. Tutman? Never thought of it. I think that's a sly one <laughs> on Dickens' part. It's a form of catechesis, I guess. We would would that be a really, more. is that an old term? I mean, uh, I'm just thinking of in, in uh, yes. Wodehouse's Jeeves and Woods, Worcester, like there's a friend named Tuppy. Um, same same so I'm thing. Wondering, yeah. Yes, hmm. I think. Same pun going on there. I thought I'd show you a Tup there. Ah, right. <laughs> And if you are interested in a quixotic character and you haven't seen The Rainmaker, I strongly recommend it. Anyone seen The Rain Rainmaker? Who's in The Rainmaker? Burt Lancaster and Catherine Hepburn. Great oh, yeah. film. Yeah, I've seen someone it. has. 
I've seen it in some time, yeah. Much over, under underrated, I guess. Uh, it's hard to find a under overrated Burt Lancaster movie. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but it's an interesting modern version, I think, of uh, Quixotic. And then I couldn't resist uh, Man of La Mancha. Everybody knows about the musical, which was uh, really quite terrible. <laughs> Good song. <laughs> Good song, yes. The one. <laughs> and I think there's just one more slide. Oh, just hang on. Uh, Dickens, I thought since this includes the Dingley Dell chapters 20, 21, and 22, or 20, 20, and 21. Well, my, my point was that the Dingley Dell chapters depict there it is, yeah. The uh, Christmas, Christmas in the country. And there's uh, Pickwick underneath the mistletoe. And I think everyone knows the story about the little boy asking, now that Mr. Dickens is dead, will Father Christmas go away as well? And a Christmas carol depicts the urban the way the urban customs perhaps could uh, modify or carry over some of the customs from the country one of the interesting points that comes up though in the dingley dell christmas is the servants ball or the mixing of the the uh, landed gentry and with the servants as depicted here one of the critics of Pickwick Papers has pointed out that even in this picture, you'll notice the servants are the ones having all the fun, or not all the fun, but they're having more fun than the masters. Uh, so I just thought that maybe the Christmas chapter would be a way, if you like, to talk about the upstairs downstairs aspect of the Pickwick Papers. That is, of course, we have Sam Weller and his father. Uh, we also have Mary, if you remember the, the maid Mary, uh, who is in sharp contrast to the other female figures in the novel. Uh, anyone want to comment uh, then on the role of the, that lower class, so to speak, pay, uh, plays? Well, I, I was surprised in this as well as the earlier dance where, uh, uh, pick, uh, let's see, I forgot who attended the, that earlier dance earlier in the book um, where they got into trouble and met Jingle, of course, and there was the, the widow. The, the, what was surprising is just the mixing of these classes because it's not... Uh, it's not all one class. Uh, the, the earlier dance was a paid dance. Um, and there were some middle upper and middle middle upper and middle lower and lower middle upper and, and so forth classes uh, together, as well as in this one. Uh, it's, a, it's a workers dance, but there were people who were not workers as well in this one. Uh. So I think someone has pointed out, and in, in this particular scene, the mistletoe scene at the servants' ball, Sam Weller is paying no attention to the mistletoe. He's he's just kissing the ladies whenever and wherever. <laughs> <laughs> um, so the I guess the last point is that the I guess you could call the. Uh, high morality of a person like Pickwick is contrasted with, with what seems like a, a much more free and open uh, romantic life among the servants. <laughs> and uh, that, that's the only way that the genteel people can main, maintain this, I guess, this distinction. Mm 
Well, I think we're about drawing to a close unless anyone else has anything further to add here. I wanted to say something about what Dickens had handy as models when he started writing. I was thinking about that. Uh, there were two writers who are worth mentioning that I think would have been in his mind. One of them was Pierce Egan, who was a generation older. He was already publishing when Dickens was a little boy. And he was famous for two kinds of writing. One of them was about boxing. He did edited a series called Boxiana that's still read by people who love prize fighting. Uh, A.J. Liebling was where I first heard of Egan. He also ran a journal called Life in London and that contained a series of episodic stories about Tom and Corinthian Jerry who see all sorts of things in London and get into various kinds of trouble and they're fairly disreputable. <laughs> so there's yeah. a point that I'll make there, which is that all the people in Pickwick papers aren't Victorians. That's right, it's pre-Victoria. Yeah, they've yeah. all grown up under other monarchs. That's right. And times that were much freer uh, in morals. The other writer that worth mentioning is uh, Robert Surtees, who was publishing episodic sketches about Mr. Jorrocks, a grocer in London who loved fox hunting. <laughs> and Surtees did a number of books with a lot of fox hunting scenes. You can often find them in used bookstores because they were very nicely illustrated by John Leach. But Surtees is sort of a representative of all the people who had, had gotten more money than they would have had a generation before, mm -hmm. and many of whom were knocking at the door of being regarded as gentlemen and taking up yes. gentlemanly pursuits. Yes. You know, all through the Victorian period, you've got uh, threats to the social order from new people yes all the way down to the veneerings yes and the the problem was that the french revolution upset the british greatly through sheer fear a large number of the existing people in england at the turn of the century were under 17 huge percentage of children and that's why you ended up with Sunday schools and education for all and so there was a there was a shift within the powers that be and the, the static thing and the other thing is when you are greatly repressed Jack the Ripper becomes possible in other words that repression that came when they even had to cover the legs of, of chairs and tables mm, as yes. Victorianism <laughs> arrived um, led to all sorts of, of ways of people pushing the bounds out and hence when the servants came to be allowed to mix in a way it was a way of putting you know behaving in a way that you fancied doing but wasn't related to your class because you could throw yes. the class off just for that time. Yes yes indeed yeah but I sometimes get the feeling that uh, if it weren't for the servants and the Pickwick Papers, it would be a mu less funny, much less funny book. <laughs> oh, it's a very <laughs> funny book. <It's> <laughs> <laughs> and the con maybe the contrast between the servants and the their betters, perhaps. Well, I their think betters don't look that better. <laughs> How's that? Sorry. I said the betters don't look that better, except for maybe Pickwick. <laughs> no, no. <laughs> Pickwick really never does anything 
with Tupman and Winkle and Snodgrass. They're, they start out as people with one particular interest and they don't, uh, it doesn't develop them, it seems to me. They're right. never very interesting. They're sort of right. cartoon characters, if you think about it, but they make the story build and bring you that wonderful humor in contrast and so on. Well, that's well, how I think, he just, I think he just found gold when he found the Wellers. You know? Absolutely. Yes, yes. Absolutely. yes. brilliant. Mm -hmm. well, I think I'm about ready to draw it to a close. Uh, thanks everyone for your contributions. They've been great. Peggy, do you have your turtle? You. <laughs> Thank you for joining us this evening Thank or this you. afternoon. Thank you. Where am I? Here He's adorable. <laughs> oh. I, love tortoises. I love tortoises. He's so cute. Oh my God. Yeah, she's an ornate box turtle that I found in the road in Florida 51 years ago. Well, wow. 51 years wow. ago? Yeah. We had them in Illinois, but we don't really have them in Colorado. It's one of the bad things about Colorado. Well, like the uh, they have reasons why you find them in certain habitats and not others. Yeah, anyway, her right. name is Eva and she's, uh, I need to get her warmer. <laughs> Hi, Eva. How many years Hi, ago Eva. did you say? Wow. I, I want one, but I have to feed it meat and I don't want to. Mm -hmm. <laughs> really, get a dog. You have a dog. You have a wonderful dog. It's much easier and better. <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> but thank you. I wanted to see him to her. <laughs> yeah, to her. And thanks, Wayne. And thanks, Courtney. Thank you. <laughs> thank you, Wayne. It was wonderful. Thank you. Yeah, well, thank, thank you. Thank you. Yes, very thank much. you, that Wayne. That was great. Thank that you. was really very great. Sorry. Thank, thank you, Wayne. Appreciate it. Thank you. Really. And, and thank you, everyone. Thank you. I'm going to be sending out some information about some holiday programming that the Dickens Project is is uh, sponsoring. Um, I'll send that out in an email to you. And I just wanted to wish everyone a very happy Thanksgiving and happy holidays. We'll see you again in January. It's going to be a little while. So um, I hope that you have very pleasant holidays. Thank you. You too. I wish you well. Wish everybody. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, everybody. Bye. Thank you. Bye. 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 Bye.